We bring together for you the best photographers in the world. Andy Warhol said my favorite color is white and my favorite color is black. So use the whites, use the blacks. Don't have 50 shades of gray. We'll have that as well, but use the blacks and use the whites. I, I got uh, fascinated in sharks um, because I felt the sharks hadn't been photographed well. After about 30 hours dedicated in the water to, to this, I, I got the big shot. Um, of the shark and the seal, and I still think it's the strongest picture in, in, of shark predation that I know, and it's pin sharp. And then someone said to me, do you see that picture in the Daily Telegraph? Can I get a big one from my office? Because I want anyone that comes into my office to be very scared of me, and the best way of doing that is to have a big shark eating something behind my desk. He said, and he said, how much would it cost? And I said, I don't know, but we'll put it in a nice frame, maybe 5,000 pounds. And he said, okay, I'll have two. And that was when the penny dropped that the way to make money from my kind of photography was in fine art, producing limited edition fine art prints that were aesthetically strong enough or evocative enough that people would put them on their wall. I think a mistake a lot of uh, photographers, wildlife photographers make is that they go on a trip without any specific idea of what kind of African animal they're gonna be shooting. And uh, for me, you go, you choose the animal and then you know where you're gonna to go to photograph the animal. And by far and away, the best place in the world to photograph elephants is Amboseli. Wildlife photographers, many of them use telephotos far too much. If you're going to be photographing a beautiful woman, you're never going to shoot her with a 400 millimeter lens or even a 200 or 300. You'd shoot her with a standard lens or a wide angle. And it should be the same with animals. It's then just the logistical issue is how you get yourself in a position to do that whilst remaining safe. The great beauty of, of elephants is there's no animal where their predicted path uh, can be determined with, with greater clarity and assurance than, than an elephant. They tend to walk in straight lines. So if you see a herd walking across the dry lake, you get 200 yards ahead of them and you know where they're probably, where they're gonna, within a yard, where they're gonna come. You've got the peak of Kilimanjaro peeking out over the top of the clouds. Um, and the light's getting better every five minutes. These are probably not bad circumstances. You can see the big guy with that big tusk over there on the left. Sadly, that's about eight grand at the local market, and that's 60 grand in China. You put the remote down, um, and you pre-focus, and then you get the hell out of there so that they are in no way detoured by you. And they probably don't see the camera until they're about a foot and a half away from it, which is perfect, because that's what you want. Um, so you want proximity and a ground level perspective. Okay, so I'm going to get out of the car. I'm going to set up a remote. Oh, let's need a bit of elephant manure. Okay, let's get out of here. Okay, let's go and grab it. There's nothing I want to do less than photograph with blue sky and sunshine. I want moody, uh, almost sort of impending doom skies, and you get that in Amboseli in, in October. It's the best canvas in which to paint with light and take pictures of anywhere in the world, I think. The behavior of elephants has changed because of cattle, because the Maasai brought their cattle in in big numbers into, into the park and that's resulted in, in more humans and more lions. So the elephants don't behave in the way that they used to, and lake crossings are rarer. I position scouts on the hills overlooking 
uh, Amboseli Dry Lake. And as soon as we, they see the beginnings of a herd crossing the lake, we'll, we'll find out. Um, and on this occasion, it was the middle of the day, which doesn't tend to suit my style because the sun's too high, but gratifyingly, there was quite a lot of cloud cover. And it was a big herd, it was 25 uh, elephants. And uh, I didn't even have my, my, my phot photographic clothing on. I was just hanging around in swimming trunks and loafers. But we charged there to the lake. It must have, done, must have been going goodness knows what speed. And the series was about 15 minutes. But there was one lovely moment where I was lying on the ground. Um, and the elephants were about 60 yards away from me. And they just didn't know which whether to go left of me or right of me. They don't tend to charge there because there is no vegetation, so they're not surprised. They know the humans there. The time you've got to be careful with an elephant is when you surprise it. But, but in Amboseli, you're quite safe, relatively. And they just huddled together. And I knew as soon as when I pressed the trigger, I thought this, is, this composition is coming together rather nicely. And then when I got back, um, I knew I'd got a very big image. Well, my, my approach is twofold. Firstly, that you have to be close. Um, and borrowing from Robert Kappa of the pictures, if not good enough, you're not close enough. Um, Ansel Adams also said that the lens looks both ways. It's truer and truer as the lens gets shorter and shorter. I don't think the lens necessarily looks both ways with a 400. It's more likely to look both ways with a 50 or a 35 because it's going right back into your soul. I think also if you're photographing a dangerous animal, if your line of sight is higher than the eyes of the animal, that immediately hints at an artificial encounter. It hints at the fact that you're um, higher uh, than the animal. No more so than polar bears. And I've wasted so much time photographing polar bears. Because no, if a polar bear comes up to a boat and you photograph it from the deck, looking down at the polar bear, looking up at you, that's just pulp. There's, there's nothing interesting in that photograph other than for it to show your kids when you get home. So we did a lot of research um, as to the best place in the world to photograph uh, polar bears and for me to get close and be safe. And we found a place where for about a week, this very strange behavior in that the polar bears seem to be in collaboration with the humans because the Inuits are, are whaling and they bring whales in and the, the bears now know that the humans are their friends because they can feed off the, the whale carcasses. And for about two weeks, uh, you can get very close to the polar bears. And there's one picture I've got, which is, um, is it was printed in the Telegraph recently and sells very well, where I actually managed to take a selfie of my, myself in the polar bear's eyes because I was a foot and a half away. And I had an Inuit fisherman behind me saying, I think you're okay with this one. And it was almost the, 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 the ultimate example of putting trust in someone else because the polar bear was two foot from my, my legs. I think with lions, uh, uh, again, I want to photograph lions from the ground up. But uh, a remote control is, is very much the way, way that I like to photograph dangerous animals. Um, I, can't, I can't really see any other way to do it. Uh, uh, you've got to be a bit careful because the cameras can be eaten or uh, Nikon are fed up with me because whenever I bring back a damaged camera, normally you've got all these boxes to tick like dropped it or fell in the water and I have to fill in new things like kicked by elephant. eaten by a lion um, and so they, they, they find it quite whenever I go down and see them in Richmond they go which box are you going to take this this time but they, they quite enjoy it because I guess it's a different experience for them trying to mend a lion eaten a, a D4S or whatever the key to strong photography of the, the kind that I do not, not doing a fashion shoot for Vogue is access it is about putting in the spade work, logistically and research-wise, to find yourself in the right position at the right time to then use that conduit and use your heart and your brain and your eye. But those things are all secondary to getting in yourself in that position, whether it be with an individual, whether it be with a dangerous animal, whether it be in a, in a scene. Um, and so I think the actual art of pressing the, the trigger is maybe 5% of the job, 95% of the job is finding yourself in the position where you want to then go and take the trigger.
I'm just trying to get the silhouettes with the dust flying up. This is quite scary. Uh, nearly, bloody nearly. Not quite, I think, nearly. I also admire photographers who understand that if, they're t if they come back from a trip with 200 good photographs, that's too many. Um, I think plurality is the bane of many photographers. Uh, I think I've taken this year, this year, I think maybe four good pictures and maybe two really, really strong pictures that will stand the test of time. So that's six, six in 12 months. I know people would look and say, well, that's not very good. But the whole point is that's what you're looking to do. If it was that easy, how, would, how on earth could you be selling a picture for a huge sum of money if you can just leave Heathrow on Monday and take a picture on Tuesday? You can't. Be inspired. Be better. Be great.